Hello and welcome to Life Beyond the Numbers, the podcast for people who are curious about how to have a more fulfilling work life. We live in a world largely driven by numbers, logic and reason. But how we feel at work and about our work impacts us, our organisations and society. There is a relationship between the numbers of our organisations and the life beyond the numbers. I'm Susan Michrielon, your host. I've lived and worked in many countries. I've met people who love what they do and people who don't. People who bring their full selves to work and people who won't. But one thing that I've learned that is common to us all is that we are all unique and have unique experiences. And it's helpful to know that there are others who think like we do, or have had struggles too, or have gone where we want to go, or can show us things we didn't know. So join me and my guests as we place a lens on the human side of work life by sharing insights, stories and strategies to inspire you to let your uniqueness shine. Hello and welcome to episode 162 of Life Beyond the Numbers. This week we're heading into the archives. I haven't been in the best health for the last couple of weeks. I'm recovering and trying to get my energy back. And so you've got an episode from the archives rather than a newly edited episode. I did have a think about what episode needs to be re-listened to and the one that popped into my head was episode number 13 never think you're reaching too high with a lady called Margaret de Valois and it was just such a pleasure and a joy to re-listen to this episode and it was definitely one that I needed to hear right now so I'm hoping you'll get something from this that you didn't hear the first time round and perhaps you're a new listener so you may never have come across this episode. What I will do is at the very end of the episode I'm just going to come back on briefly and share a couple of the nuggets that I really really took away from this episode. So for now I'll hand you over to me and Mags from October 2020. One thing to say is the sound isn't always great on this episode, but bear with us because it is really a joyful conversation. Today I'm joined by Margaret de Valois. Welcome, Mags. Hi, hi Susan, how are you doing? Very well, thanks. So Mags, I like to talk about stereotypes a lot and busting the stereotype myth that many of us carry around. And I think the stereotype I have of an actuary, you're about as far removed from that stereotype (laughs) as I can imagine. But tell us about becoming an actuary, Mags. Well, I mean, firstly, is it worth just setting out what actuaries do? Oh, yeah, maybe. Quite quite often, I'll people say to me, oh, what do you do? And I sort of dread that question. It's like, oh, how do I answer this? Um, (laughs) Because if I say, oh, I'm an actuary, they'll either be quite polite. If they know what it is, great, brilliant, fabulous. Yeah, oh, that's great. Fab, you know, how bad? Is it interesting? If they don't know what it is, some people will say, oh, I don't know what that is. Or a lot of people just go, oh, nice, smile. And then say, oh, would you like a drink? Or what? (laughs) talk about the football or something else Uh, but anyway so what do actuaries do so actuaries make sense of the future that's quite a broad definition so effectively we look at past data to put some sort of assumptions and um, parameters on future trends and that is typically in economics mortality which has been very interesting recently with covid Uh, Because one of the things that actuaries have spent a lot of time doing and and, and are in charge of, really, we've got the government's actuary department and the continuous mortality investigation, and they put together mortality tables. And these tables estimate how long people are going to live 
and they're used by insurance companies, by pension schemes, and by various organisations. So the role that actuaries play is quite important, but it's something that isn't high profile. It's, it, we're more high profile now. I mean, we've actually got an actuaries COVID response group that was put wow. together. Yes. And um, that group is really key in pulling together some of the statistics that you might have seen, looking at, you know, deaths and what's happened and how deaths this year compared to last year and so on. So they get really involved in that stuff. So, so actuaries are doing some pretty quite sexy, exciting stuff that, <laughs> that we're, not, we're not on the TV very much and we're not really, you know, out there. But we're stacking our deaths with our spreadsheets. Um, Typically people, uh, actuaries are good at maths, a lot of them come from a maths background and we, we also get involved in economics investments, which is um, what I spent a bit of my time doing in, in London. So I managed some money uh, at a company called Schroeder's and we looked after a couple of billion pounds worth of, of assets for pension schemes. Um, many many people listening to this probably in those schemes and uh, so yeah we've got a pretty pretty important role but you're right the stereotypical actuary used to be man in a suit sat there getting on with his maths probably not the life and soul of the party so that's the stereotype why we have that stereotype i don't know because i've met loads of really cool actuaries like a do you know what? It is a bit like accountants, but they're people. They're exactly. people at the end of the day. They've got a life. People don't just do that. They do other stuff. Um, and one of the things that I've found with, with the actuaries I've met, and I've, a lot of them, they're quite high achievers. They're quite focused. They do the most amazing stuff. So I know actuaries that have climbed Everest. I know actuaries that have run 20 marathons in 20 days. I, I know actuaries that have done amazing things. And so it, the irony is actually, they're probably more exciting than average. Um, <laughs> okay, let's get the carried away here now. I don't shout about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't shout about it. So um, anyway, so I don't think I, I am not a stereotypical actuary. I've even met a few of them. Yeah, um, no, it, I mean, it's <laughs> fair enough. I think it, stereotypes are nonsense anyway, and people are just people and we aren't what we do. Yeah. We are who we are. That's it. Yeah. So you started out in the big six at the time, I guess, Max. I joined Coops and Librands and, and I signed up to Coops and Librands but joined PwC. So um, that was literally the first week of my employment with them. But yeah, I'd, I'd done maths at university. I, I also do a lot of music and I wanted to go to music college. I wanted to be a, a clarinetist. I wanted to play an orchestra. Wow. But I wasn't quite good enough. I was sort of on the cusp of, of almost being, but not quite, and frustratingly spending quite a lot of my time um, working towards it. But in the end, decided that I was going to go off into the city instead, and on the basis that I could always afford to buy my clarinet reeds and new clarinet if I got a good job in um, finance. So that was my route into, into the city and I joined, it was 1997 and yes, the world was a very different place. I remember, gosh, I don't feel old, but I feel old when I start talking about this. I remember I having to get our letters typed out and printed in time for the post because we didn't have emails. And then we had, I mean, did we have spreadsheets? Of course we had spreadsheets, but not the power that we've got now. You know, I handwritten calculations. Um, having to, to write out calculations by hand, give them to your um, manager to check, and they'd literally be ticking it like your homework. They'd send it back. And it was a slower pace of work. It was, wasn't it? Much slower, but a lot more considered in some ways. Thorough. Thorough. Yeah, absolutely. And I was lucky enough to work for, a, I went into an amazing team at PwC, the actuarial team there, and uh, many of whom are still with PwC and good friends. And we were a really, really strong team and we did a lot of merger and acquisitions work. So supporting the rest of the biz, PwC business on transactions. So I was fortunate um, from day one, really, not to be sat at a desk doing spreadsheet work. I was out clients and lawyers offices and going into data rooms and and 
helping some of the partners and senior managers do negotiations. So I was sort of thrown in at the deep end in some ways, but I really enjoyed that. And having had a, a background in music performance, I just absolutely um, thrived on the presentations and the being in the meetings and being in front of people and, and that side of it. And I think that kept me going. If I'd have been sat at a computer in an insurance company putting mortality tables together, I don't think I would have lasted. And I suppose there's also great variety in working for someone like PwC. You get exposure to different types of clients and... Yeah, yeah. it was wonderful. It was the different types of clients, the different um, disciplines. So I was working with people in tax, accountants, lawyers. It was fabulous. It really was. And also traveling. Mm. So I remember uh, I was sat at my desk one day and, and a PA came out and said, so you always had a drawer and in there would be your passport, a change of underwear and a toothbrush and this was just in case you were called away to a data room that was somewhere exotic so the PA came out and she said have any of the students got the passport with them today and of course I'm like me 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 please pick me pick me and and then it was like okay get your stuff together um you need to get on the next Eurostar out to Paris go and meet the team they're out at the Scandinavian Arts office I think it was and do the deal oh and on the way can you buy six shirts for the partners because they're stuck out there and they can't get back so it was that sort of world of of just really living the dream and then you'd get there and you'd be in this beautiful hotel you know, get, going from being at university to 12 months later that it was it was fabulous it really was and i just threw myself into it totally and and what was there for almost 20 years not not just at pwc but then deloitte's traders and I really enjoyed my time in the city. Yeah. Amazing. And, I mean, it, you know, clearly like accountancy, actuarial, it, it's very technical, but there is, I guess there was a point in your career or maybe you were always like this where you saw people as just being as important to getting your job done as the technical side. Yeah, I worked out pretty early on that, that the thing that I was, that I had the edge in or I, I had a gift a gift of the gab <laughs> I don't know <laughs> but but it, it became apparent pretty early on that that what I was better at was explaining the technical stuff as opposed to creating it myself and doing the numbers so very quickly I chose a route that enabled me to do more of the the talking about the actuarial stuff than doing it and I mean, I, I could do the numbers and I can do the numbers, yeah. but I, I wasn't the sharpest actuarial knife in the drawer. You know, there were some really, really very talented, smart mathematicians in the industry. And I was sort of, you know, on the cusp of, of I always felt like I was winging it, to be honest. I think many of us do, but I really yes. did sit there thinking, how am I here? What imposter syndrome? What on earth? How did I actually get here? Um, and when I qualified, I still sort of sat there and thought, really? Have I really done this? So yeah, I, I ended up doing a lot of the communication side. So presenting to clients and actually to members of pension schemes, which I, that's still my favorite thing to do. And I still do a lot of that now, um, working with the members of the schemes and sitting down with them and explaining to them what is going on in their pension. I find that so rewarding. And again, it's, it's kept me in the industry. If I didn't have that, I think I might have, have chosen to do something else. And it, do people understand their pensions? I think people are becoming more and more engaged now. People are realising that they do need to save for a pension. Workplace pensions has changed things in that everyone who's employed is in a pension scheme unless they choose not to. So that actively makes them think about what, whether they do want to opt out. Do people understand it? Not until the point that they have to. Mm. And sometimes that's too late. It's no different to anything else, diet, exercise. It's something that you invest in for your future. And it's tricky to make the right choices. I heard recently that if you put five pounds a day into your child's bank account from the day they're born until they're, I think it's 16 or 18, then by the time they reach pension age, there'll be a million quid in there. And that's because of the impact of compound interest. So 
every time you put a fiver in, that fiver earns interest, then you put another fiver in and that does and so on. So that's a really good example of how engaging with pensions early on can make a huge difference. But the reality is a lot of us don't and we get to 40 and think, oh, oh, I suppose I better think about that. So it's changing. Yeah, I was reading something recently where they said if you simulate what you look like when you're 70 years of age, you're more likely to invest in your pension. Really? And yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? We find it very hard to picture ourselves being old mm. and needing it. But if we actually see an image of what we might look like, then we feel for that person and we yeah. start saving for them. Of course. Mate. Yeah, that's interesting. I'll um, maybe mention that to some of my clients and see, see if we can get some more engagement with members. It is true, though, that when we actually can see something, we do value it more. Mm. And there's that whole theory around if you go into a car showroom, they want you to get in the car because the minute you sit in it, suddenly it's more valuable to you and you're more likely to buy it so it's a similar thing isn't it saying if you can see what you will look like at that age you're more likely to invest in that yeah uh, human psychology yeah yeah I like what you say about diet or exercise as well because it is about being sustainable isn't it it's it investing is. in your future now helps you live sustainably as long as you live yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah, it so sounds it simple yeah, and inherently pensions are simple. You put some money aside and you leave it there and then you draw on it when you need it later on. Yeah. That's all it is. <laughs> There's nothing more to it than that, really. And I think actually when it's coming out of your salary, it's so much easier as well, isn't it? Yeah. That Yeah, because yeah. then it's just happening and you don't have to consciously make that choice. That's right, that's yeah. right. And, and I think the, the problem some people have had with it is the perception that it isn't theirs. So it's been taken away from them. We've taken money out of your salary and we've put it somewhere. So people don't feel or haven't felt that they own it. And of course, of course you own it. It's your money. So I've, I've now got on my banking, I, I, I bank with Lloyd's and they own Scottish Widows. And when I go onto my online banking, I can now see my Scottish Widows pension. So oh, I've got my current account, I've got my savings account and I've got my pension which is fabulous because that's my money. And I'm just like, great, there it is. And so initiatives like that are really helping people get to grips with the fact that a pension isn't your employer taking money away from you. It's actually you saving money. And um, that sort of stuff's great. Uh, yeah, because I have a self-invested pension plan, mm -hmm. um, a SIP. And like that, I can see it all the time. And I find that really helpful. And as you should, I, and this should be the case for all pension schemes. And the government's working towards that with the, the um, dashboard initiative where um, you're going to be able to effectively log on. So as you log on to government gateway or whatever, and then it would show you all of your pension schemes there. You can do that with the state pension as well. I don't think people realise this. If you go on to, I think it is gov.com gov and you can put your date of birth in and your national insurance number and it'll show you what your state pension is going to be. Wow, I didn't know that. No, I know. The, the biggest issue with pensions has been communication. And that's one of the reasons, again, that I felt so called to stay in the industry and work on that side of it, because that's the area that, that needs most help, really. And so this is where your drive for speaking social media <laughs> came from, or and media even. Yeah, so the media is an interesting one. So my dad's in TV, right? So I hold my hands up straight away. He is, is an amazing guy and he works for ITV actually. And as a child, I used to go and meet him after work. And those were the days where I could go on set. And I remember doing my homework on the bar in the Rover. was waiting for him to finish work, you know, just like go and sit in there, Mags, and crack on. And I'd be <laughs> sat there, you know, just doing my work. Um, so I was brought up in, in an environment where TV was sort of normal and we were very happy messing around at home, filming each other and so on. And obviously doing quite a lot of music. and I did a bit of theatre at uni. It wasn't something that I was sort of phased by. And then I, how did I get into doing the TV work? Goodness me. I got put forward, actually. So the BBC did a programme probably about 10 years ago now, and it was called Expert Women. 
and they wanted to find at the time we used to call it like x factor for presenters but they wanted to find people who were specialists in their field but who could go on tv and and be professional because what people need really is you want to turn up on set you want to know what you're doing have a belt put your mic on the tv companies just don't want people who don't know what they're doing so i got put forward for this course and i basically um, got shortlisted there was 10 of us out of how however many hundreds or thousands i don't know and um, we went off to white city and we we got trained up we did two days there did loads of amazing things like went on um one show we went on women's hour like loads of little things they just put us through our paces and then following that i i got called to go on um, various news channels and then that went on to sky because once people see you they go oh yeah right you're the pensions person and yeah it was lovely actually i did probably um about a year of doing a lot of of tv interviews and i thoroughly enjoyed it at the same time i made a couple of little films as well so that it started to um expand i did something about the history of mortality tables and i made a little program for bbc daily politics <laughs> um, and it was great it was brilliant so that was the start of it and then i had a career break funnily enough i left london about seven years ago decided to move and I have my, my um, twins, who are now four. So I've got identical twins, two little wow. girls. Wow. Yeah. And I wasn't doing any TV at all. <laughs> I wasn't doing very much. I was doing work and fitting that around childcare, but all the TV had gone out the window. And it was quite frustrating because I get called up by Spotlight and they'd say, oh, can you come on and talk about pensions? And I have to say, well, I can't because obviously I can't get up at five in the morning, do my hair and makeup and turn up at a studio when I've got two little girls that mm. I need to look after. Mm. Um, so I, I didn't do very much. And then I was out at lunch with a good friend of mine, Lou, and she had also moved to Cornwall from London and her background was in TV and she used to work for MTV. So she had an amazing job where she used to go and interview pop stars and like totally the opposite end of the spectrum to me. <laughs> so, well, how was your TV experience? Oh, well, you know, I get absolutely grilled on daily politics about interest rates. And she'd be like, oh, I interviewed um, Leonardo DiCaprio or something. It's like, <laughs> how was that? <laughs> but anyway, we met actually in, in a shop, bizarrely. We became great friends. And we said, oh, let's do some TV. And I also was friends with a, a lovely guy called Shane Solomon, who runs the Cornwall Channel. And he'd just done some videos for my partner. And he'd done a really good job of it. And I'd sort of sat there on the set, being a very probably annoying director stroke girlfriend, going, oh, you need to do this, you need to do this. Um, anyway, so Lou and I sat there and we were like, do you know what, should we start a TV programme? bonkers totally bonkers and i said yeah i'll give shane a ring and let's see if we can get in studio and let's see if we can get a chat show going and we did and so we thinking women has been going a year we've had fifty thousand views of our amazing show. i know it's it's crazy and we've now got sponsors that are working with us and it's brilliant it's absolutely brilliant i love it it's just the best it's one day a month we go into, into studio and we record it and it's just fab and we've had musicians on there we've got uh, we're doing a cookery slot on the next show so we've got a kitchen in the studio so we're going to be doing <laughs> doing the cooking thing um it's great absolutely love it and, um, and i'm still obviously doing my pensions work and i'm doing some business coaching as well so life has become quite a quite a mix really a portfolio of different things which is which is great and fun. Well, I, I was chatting to somebody earlier today and I was saying to them, I mean, they're 22 or three and trying to plan ahead of what they want to do. And I said, well, variety is the secret to an interesting life. Yeah. And if you'd have asked me at 22, 23, what I wanted to do, I would have said I want to be a part, senior partner at PwC. Um, I, things I change. I can't think of anything worse. No disrespect to the senior partner of PwC, but oh my goodness, no. I'm very happy 
I think I've realized that I love people. I like meeting lots of different people and I like doing the communicating. It's a wonderful thing as you go through your career that you learn what you're good at. And one of the things I've been very lucky to have been able to have done is to choose the things that I'm good at and leave behind the things that I'm not so good at and have the, the confidence to say, do you know what, actually, that's not really my bag. Yeah. Please and, your and, strengths. Oh, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And but it's hard because when you're in these big organizations, they do put you on a program and push you through. And I know when I, I was at my last job, proper job, before I started working for myself, um, <laughs> they were very keen for me to take a bigger role and be promoted. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. And they said, well, what are you going to go and do? And I said, I don't know, but I don't want to do that. And they were gobsmacked because how dare I turn down partnership at a large accounting firm? You know, that's just not what you do. But it wasn't right for me. And I knew that. And what I'm doing now is is far more rewarding, much more rewarding. Uh, yeah, I think it's I suppose there's a there's a path, you know, a, a career ladder. And oftentimes people just follow it without pursuing exactly. what they're passionate about do you know susan that's so true and it's something that actually lou and i were talking about the other day the this business of quite often we don't make choices in life we just do what's put in front of us and there is something about making active choices and really considering what it is that you want to do not what is easy to do and that is something that i really try and focus on in everything that I, I do and every decision I make, you know, do I want to do that or am I doing it just because it's been put in front of me? And again, it's going back to food and drink and everything. Life can be life can be more rewarding, I think, if you do start to choose and create. Create, yes. You know, because yes. there's choosing. There's also you can decide which direction you want to go in. You may not really know where what what it's going to turn out like but you create it as you go that's it and it's 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 almost moving away from the plan and letting it just flow be and I I talk to clients about business plans and and I'll say right if you've got a business plan and they, they do or they don't and if they do it's like okay great and I'll say, well, how often do you update it? And they say, well, I don't because this is the plan. It's like, well, no, no. The point is the plan needs to change. You've still got to have the plan, but the plan needs to change. If the plan hasn't changed, then this is not flowing. This is not right. <laughs> so um, and life's like that as well. The plan does need to change. I, mean, I never thought that I'd be a mum, ever, ever, to the point where I even, I even did an interview in the Daily Mail about, about not wanting children. Um, and which was hilarious at the time but anyway and I ended up having twins at 40 and people were gobsmacked and I remember people saying well you know what at least you're having twins with you it wouldn't be one you've got to have two (laughs) (laughs) and one of the things I am very grateful for is I do feel that I've put my money where my mouth is in terms of moving out of London showing that you can continue and work as a woman from home fitting around your children you do not need to be and now with what's happened with covid a lot of people can't be in the office but certainly when i left london seven years ago and i told people that i was going to work for myself as an actuary from cornwall people looked at me and and just i might as well have been saying that i was going to go to the moon (laughs) Can I imagine? <laughs> yeah, so well, that's just not going to work. And I was scared. I'll be honest, I was scared. But I thought, do you know what? If I don't do this, how will my children or the next generation ever think anything apart from having to go to the city, put on that blue suit from Marks and Spencers that I hated? Oh my goodness mm. me, like my office clothes. I used to spend money on these beautiful clothes that I really just didn't like but had to wear and the thought that that 
that I could get out of that and work from home. And as you see, I've got a bright orange jumper on today and I've still got my city pearls on. I don't seem to be able to rid, rid myself of those, but the legacy remains. And the thought that I'd be able to work from, from Cornwall and go for a run on the beach and take my kids, we're going to climbing more later on today and do things like that was unheard of. You know, you, you just had to turn up in the city in your uncomfortable shoes, go and get your coffee and sit at your desk and, and get on. And be grateful for your job. Be grateful for your job. And if you do leave your desk, I mean, remember in one of the organisations I worked in, there was a rule that if you left your desk, you had to put your jacket on. Oh, for God's sake. I know, I know. Isn't it crazy, actually, just what you're talking about, the, the suits and, and that, like, rule? I mean, come it was on. Mad. And, and it, it didn't help anyone. I remember going to events and just seeing a sea of 40 and 50-year-old men in blue suits with ties that looked similar. And I'd have no idea who was who because there was no distinguishing feature. And it's awful to say, but I struggled and... It was easier for us women because you could wear a red jacket or you could wear um, a pair of shoes that were a different colour. But that was really it. You know, it wasn't much else that we could do. It was a strange, strange environment, actually, looking back. And it wasn't very diverse at all. It really wasn't. And it's a joy now being able to access so much more diversity online. So the teams that I've been working with recently have been so much more diverse even things like seeing into people's homes on a zoom meeting it tells you a bit about someone doesn't it and it's like, doesn't oh, it? yeah it's the person who's got these massive loads of books and who'd thought that they there was i was on a zoom call the other day and someone had loads of model toys at the top of their bookshelf and i was just so fascinated i was like wow you know this this person has that's got this whole collection and they've probably gone into the office for years and never mentioned it because we just yeah. don't and you start to see people as people as human yes. beings that have lives yeah, yeah. and it, it will start to burst stereotypes that is right absolutely because there is no stereotype and that is the point I don't think there is a stereotype because when you actually get in when you start to learn about people we're all different we're all unique and we've all got our quirks. We've all got little things that we enjoy and do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be human. And I think the only thing that's been wrong has been that we haven't been able to talk about ourselves and be ourselves. We're not um, different. We've not been able to express those differences. Yeah, but definitely in the 90s, when I went into Deloitte, your personal and professional were two separate people. Yeah. You weren't encouraged to bring your whole self to work. Mm. Um, no, and I know. that's why you have a lot of miserable people in Absolutely. the world. I, I remember my first appraisal and I actually think that they were right in mentioning this, but I, I'm quite annoying. So I walk around and I sing to myself and um, this is just something that I've done and always done. And, and I was sat there in the office and, and at some point, I don't even remember doing it, but apparently I'd been singing to myself. It's probably hugely annoying to the people around me, particularly I was quite into musical theatre. So I was probably sat there singing Cats or something um, very quietly just to myself. So anyway, I got to my first appraisal and they'd done the 360 feedback and I said, right, we've got some feedback from our colleagues that we want to share with you. I was like, okay, right. And I was super keen to hear what it was because of course I'm like, right, tell me and then I'll fix it. Yeah. I'll just be whatever you want me to be because I want to be promoted. Um, and that in itself was awful, wasn't it? I mean, it's like a method of control. Like, tell me what I need to do and I'll do it. Just anything. And they said, yeah, you've got to stop singing in the office, Max. And I was a bit horrified. I was like, really? So that means that I've got to come into this building for eight nine hours and actually it was longer than that because we used to stay late I mean I've all nighters at times mm. um so I've got to come in here and I'm not allowed just to have a little you know sing song quietly to myself and like no and and I was like oh right yeah no I get that that's fine yeah fine get it but then fast forward 10 years and I look back now and I was I think we talk about controlling relationships and I think I was possibly in a controlling relationship with the city 
not with any organization in particular, not with any individual in particular, but with the, the institution of it. And it, it, yeah, it took a little while to undo that, I think. So it's just, I absolutely accept that it could be annoying. So um, if whoever it is is listening, then I agree. <laughs> but I'm using it as an example of how now when I'm at home, I'll have the radio on and I can be writing reports and singing along. So I'm using it as an example of how being in that city, for me, compromised me gradually over a long period of time. And by the time I came out, I wasn't me anymore. Yeah. Any situation that is bad for you in some way, if you keep going, mm -hmm. the day you step away and realize I am not myself, yeah. you can't believe how much of yourself you've allowed to be chipped away at. Oh, I know. I know. And I, I remember I left my job and I decided I was going to have a year off. And even that was terrifying because I didn't even have a gap year. I went straight from from uni to work because that's what you did you you got on and got on with it so I hadn't done anything and, and I had this year off and I I went and I was lucky enough to be able to stay in a friend's apartment in Newquay overlooking Fistral Beach and I thought do you know what I'm gonna learn to surf <laughs> like you do because <laughs> I thought well that's a challenge yeah I've, I've, I can ski and I've ticked a lot of those boxes but surfing yeah that looks pretty pretty tough I'll give that a go. There's a bit of a theme here. If it's difficult, then I'm all over it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I picked up on that early on. <laughs> stuff, you know. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, I'll give that a go. And I threw myself into it quite literally, <laughs> threw myself into the sea and spent a year just hanging out in, in Newquay and surfing. And interestingly, I didn't really talk about my time in the city. So when people ask me what I did, so I'd meet someone in the beach bar, like, what do you do? I'd say, oh, I'm just having some time out surfing. And of course, that's what everyone was doing. So suddenly I was part of this community of people that didn't really have a serious, like they, in, at the time I was thinking, no, it's not a serious job. These people are, are, are wonderful and they work around the world in bars and restaurants. So they're very serious about what they do, but they're just not actuaries or accountants or lawyers. And um, I found it really really bizarre being in that environment at that time I still live around Newquay and now seven years on I, I'm totally chilled out about it and I walk around Waitrose in my flip-flops sometimes and it's strange how I've now adapted back to myself whereas when I first came out of the city I was just indoctrinated so, so indoctrinated yeah but I mean it, it's a wonderful place and I had a wonderful time I, I'd never change it and it's being aware of what it certainly what it was probably isn't now and yeah people, what feeds your soul well that's right yeah that's right mm, very cool and my uh we've talked about music and singing quite a bit but you were in the London Philharmonic Choir is that correct? Yeah, I was. So again, um, typical me, I decided as I couldn't be a professional clarinetist that I would do a bit of singing and I've had singing lessons at school. I didn't think that I was a particularly amazing singer, but I thought, right, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll apply for the best choir in London and if I don't get in, I'll then apply for the next best choir in London <laughs> and we'll just work down until I find a choir that'll have me. Um, so I went along to audition for the London Phil and I got in and I was absolutely gobsmacked. I just couldn't believe it. I remember coming home to my husband at the time and just saying, I got in. And he said, what? And so he said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, I'm now in the London Philharmonic Chorus and I have to turn up four nights a week and rehearse and two weekends of the month. And we've got 10 concerts in the next six months at the Royal Albert Hall and the Royal Festival Hall and and he was like oh right okay and you're going to do that and work I'm like, yeah yeah I'm going to work full time and do this um, and I did it for four years it was fantastic and just wonderful and I met the most amazing people I work with the most amazing conductors I was lucky enough to sing Berlioz Requiem with Sir Colin Davis in his final concert in St Paul's Cathedral. 
wow. and because I'm quite short they'd always put me at the front so I always got a, a brilliant view and I was quite often sat right behind the timpani or the brass section and it was the next best thing to playing clarinet in an orchestra and I did some wonderful things worked with Catherine Jenkins Russell Watson I was in the Doctor Who prom which was fabulous and it was just it was amazing and when I left London that was the thing that I was most sorry to leave behind but I also accepted that I'd, I'd had four years of this amazing experience performing pretty much professionally in my spare time as a hobby and that I was just very blessed to have done that so amazing um, yeah it was yes and and again the lesson from that is never think you're reaching too high if you want to do something go for it go for what you actually want because what I wanted was to sing in the London film I didn't want to sing in the Croydon whatever yeah. <laughs> I wanted to sing in the London Phil so I went and I auditioned I turned up and I got in and that was that so yeah it's something that I, I sort of say to my little daughters as well do do what you want and if people think you're reaching too high that's their problem exactly Just go for it exactly yeah, yeah. It's such a fascinating 40 minutes or whatever we've done, Mags. Really, really entertaining as well. How does someone connect with you? So I've, I've got a website, margaretdevalois.com, and you can find all my contact details on there. I'm on social media as well, so you can connect with me, me there. Always happy to hear from people who want to work with me. I'm doing some business coaching now which is great really fun because I'm getting involved in the wider bit of business as well as pensions still doing pensions work um or um yeah if anybody wants any advice mentoring or anything like that then let me know brilliant and thinking women where where can we find that okay thinking women is on Facebook we've got a Facebook page so thinking women tv it's on there brilliant well thank you so much for your time today Thank you, Susan. It's been amazing. I've really enjoyed it. It's Great. Been absolutely fab. It's been a, a nice trip down memory lane, actually. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. I hope you enjoyed listening or re-listening to that episode as much as I did. And I wonder what your key takeaways would be from listening to it. I guess... The thing that stood out for me most the first time around and again this time is the title, Never Think You're Reaching Too High. And I just love this story about how Mags said, if you want to do something, go for it. Go for what you actually want. And for her, she wanted to sing and she wanted to sing in the London Philharmonic Chorus. And that's what she aimed for. And I I think that's very, very inspiring. And perhaps it picks on another point that she says that oftentimes we don't make choices in life. We just kind of do what's put in front of us. And there's something about making active choices and really considering what it is you want to do. And to do that in every decision you make. And ask yourself, do I want to do that? Or am I just doing it because it's in front of me? And perhaps the other thing then that ties into that is you do learn what you're good at as you go through life. And then you can make a choice to leave behind the things that you're not so good at and have the confidence to say, do you know what? Actually, that's not really my bag. I think that's the nugget that I absolutely needed to hear it this time around as well. That's not really my bag. And finally, just I think one of the most unusual perceptions or perspectives on things that I've heard in a conversation was Mags and the way she talked about being in a controlling relationship with the city of London, not with any organisation in particular, not with any individual in particular, but with the institution of the whole thing. I think that's quite an interesting perspective. It may not be just about 
the job that you're in or the people that are around you, but the whole environment that you're in. And is that healthy for you? Is it an optimal environment? Is it what you want? Have you actively chosen it? Given the choice, would you actively choose it? I hope it is. I hope it's one you've chosen. I hope you're doing what you want. And I hope that you're choosing what you want. I hope that you're able to let go of what's not really your bag. And I hope you're reaching and aiming high. Until next week, I wish you all the very best wherever you are in the world. Take care. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the paths we traversed on today's episode. If something rang through for you, be sure to let me know. Or maybe you can share this with someone in your life who would benefit from listening too. And if you enjoy helping others, I'd be so grateful if you would leave a review so that people who might also be curious about their own life beyond the numbers can discover this podcast too.